Hi folks. Well, I'm sure this feels very different for you. And believe me, it feels different for me too. Uh, this is the Sunday morning service, uh, March 22nd, 2020. And of course, these are uh, unusual times and this is an unusual service. Uh, I trust this finds you well. Uh, I trust this finds you uh, doing okay and, and learning to uh, adjust to our, our new norm. I have been praying that we as a church family would handle this time well. I would invite you to join me in that prayer that in this very unique time in history that uh, we would do a great job of, of being the church. Uh, if you've not done so on the home page of our website, uh, which you uh, have gone to to get to this uh, pre-recorded message this morning, there's a, a note that I put on there a couple of days ago. Uh, let me invite you to take a minute after the service maybe to, to read through that. Uh, and also just to let you know that uh, we are here uh, to be of help to you in any way that we can. Our, our deacons are available, our staff is available. Just call the church office or call any of us directly uh, if you have something that we can uh, help you with. We did have church here last Sunday. Um, we were uh, missing some of you, understandably, but I, I thought we had a really sweet time together. Uh, I think that maybe a little bit of that is that we all knew that we weren't sure when we would be able to meet together again. Uh, with that said, uh, let me talk just a little bit about our game plan. Uh, today, of course, uh, for this service, this is pre-recorded, and we're going to do the same thing next Sunday. And then we're going to evaluate. We may possibly be going to live stream where Alan and our praise team will come in and maybe do some worship. And then uh, we all will be kind of watching, starting at 10, 15, uh, watching the service together possibility some have told me that uh, with millions of people now doing uh, live stream on Sunday mornings that there has been some trouble with the volume and, and people having trouble being able to, to see services and and I've been advised that doing the pre-recorded may be the best and so uh, it'll be something will be available to you either way if this uh, continues uh, into the coming days and so we will uh, continue to monitor this uh, we will uh, Continue to send uh, text messages and emails and post information on the website so that everybody kind of knows what's going on and, and what to expect. Uh, if distancing ourself, uh, ourselves continues to go long term, uh, then we will talk about and brainstorm and investigate some uh, different ways to stay connected as a church family. Uh, we may uh, look at doing some small groups, maybe in some homes. Uh, and with people that are uh, feeling uh, well uh, and we may also look at some other things there are some various websites where uh, everybody can see each other kind of like a conversation call but we can see each other and maybe do some things with some lessons Sunday school lessons and things like that uh, and so we'll investigate those things in the coming days and and uh, try to formulate some different options if uh, again this is going to to go longer than the next couple of weeks now let me say, if I could, another word about us not holding services. I know within the church in general, the church at large, there's a lot of debate about this. Uh, because President Trump has uh, encouraged uh, no large gatherings, some have said, well, this is the, the government dictating uh, to the church what to do. Well, I, I don't see it that way. I, my thinking, and I think our deacons and our staff, as we've discussed this, we see this First, out of concern for our church family of coming together and potentially exposing some of our church family to uh, the coronavirus. Uh, but then also, I think this has to do with the testimony of the church. I think that uh, it potentially could uh, reflect negatively on us as the world would see that we're continuing to meet, but then we're going back out and we're going to drugstores and to Walmart and to gas stations and potentially uh, spreading the virus. And I could see that potentially again reflecting negatively on us. And so those are some of the reasons that I think are behind our uh, not uh, having uh, gatherings with our church services, not appearing uh, selfish in that regard. Now this uh, leads me to want to make a comment or two about why we meet in the first place. I've always said and always taught that the church gathers together primarily for the edification of believers. We come together 
week after week, on the first day of the week, in a weekly celebration of the resurrection, we come together with people who are like-minded, people who think like we do, who have the same values that we do. And we come and we gather together, we worship together, we learn together, we grow together, and we encourage one another to stand strong in the faith so that we can go back out into the world, back into our neighborhoods and our workplaces and our family gatherings and our schools and be salt and be light to a lost world. Now our gathering together for the mutual edification, encouragement, uh, that is being challenged right now. We are going to have to do some of that on our own. We're going to have to do a better job of being created and, and feeding ourselves and encouraging ourselves in the Lord. But we can still go out. We can still be the church uh, throughout the week. In this challenging time, I believe that hearts and minds are open and we need to take advantage of that. One idea that uh, I thought of just a little bit uh, earlier today that I haven't done yet, but uh, just trying to give you an idea. Uh, my neighborhood, we've had some flooding in my neighborhood and there have been some emails that have gone around basically trying to deal with this flooding issue. But I had the idea and I'm gonna send out an email and reply uh, a little later today. And I'm gonna say, look, some in our neighborhood uh, are not as young as they used to be. And, and some have had health issues. And so I just want to make myself available, Becky and I available, that uh, if we can uh, help you, if we can pick something up for you, if we could be of service to you in that way, uh, then we are making ourselves available. Just let us know. So that's just an idea. So be creative. Think about it. Pray about it. Think about the different people that you're going to continue to have uh, contact with and try to love people, encourage them. As we talk Sunday, uh, demonstrate before them the peace that passes all understanding in a time of uncertainty. Show them that and, and be the church in this time. Well, it is time for a message, uh, but you're not gonna hear it from me this morning. Uh, this is spring break and I had uh, months ago had planned to be away and not be in town uh, this morning of March the 22nd and so I had already scheduled uh, Larry Connors to, to be with us and uh, you folks know him and you know that uh, he has a, a love for the Lord and a love for the Word and, and uh, is a very effective communicator of God's truth and so he's going to be coming and bringing uh, the message for this morning. So I want to lead us in prayer and uh, let me do that and then I'll step out of the way and Larry will come and share with you this morning from God's Word. Father, I thank you that uh, you know us and you know all things and you know all times. And Father, you are never caught by surprise by anything. I want to thank you that, uh, Lord, you know all uh, the circumstances in each of our lives. And Lord, I believe that uh, there are unique times in history where you create an opportunity for us to, uh, Lord, to shine. And I pray that you would help us to do that well individually and collectively during this time. And Father, I pray that your spirit would be active in an abundant way around us. Uh, Lord, that you would create opportunities and help us to sense those and to step into them. Uh, give us the right words to say. Help us to make those transitions from, uh, from the natural to the spiritual. Uh, Lord, to be able to engage in uh, conversation with people about who you are and where you are in the midst of all this. And so we commit that to you now. And Lord, I pray for Larry as he comes. Uh, give him clarity of thought as he opens uh, your word uh, for us this morning. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Take care. We'll talk with you soon. Well, welcome. We want to encourage you, if you have your Bibles with you, to turn to John chapter 13. We're going to be looking today at a message entitled, Proud Hearts and Dirty Feet. A caretaker was leading a group of English tourists through the home of Ludwig von Beethoven, where he lived out his last years and did his best works. And among that group of tourists was a young woman who could play the piano rather well, and she was anxious to see but one room, the room where the piano of Beethoven was kept. As the caretaker led them into that room and very carefully withdrew the dust cover, he said, ladies and gentlemen, this is the instrument from which Ludwig von Beethoven did his greatest works. 
this woman pushed herself to the front, sat down on the stool of the piano, and began to play one of Beethoven's sonatas. And when she had finished, she whirled around, looked into the face of the caretaker, and said, I suppose you have a lot of people who want to play this piano, don't you? The caretaker responded by saying, Well, miss, the great concert pianist Ignaf Paderowski was here last summer, and someone wanted him to play. And his response was, No, I am not worthy. You see, you cannot fake humility. Reminds me of the story of a, a young pastor whose preaching was a cut above the ordinary. His church was flourishing, it was growing, it was beginning to swell, and so was his head. As he had just finished his latest great masterpiece sermon that morning, as he was greeting people at the door, one of the women said, You know, Pastor, I believe that you're becoming one of the great expositors of this generation. Well, as he sort of pushed his head into the car, slipped in next to his wife, his kids in the back seat, he couldn't help but respond and repeat that story. You know, Mrs. Franklin, he said to his wife, told me that she thinks I'm becoming one of the great expositors of this generation. No response. Still looking for some kind of affirmation, he turned to his wife and said, Honey, how many great expositors do you think there are in this generation? She could no longer resist the opportunity to set the record straight, and she simply looked into his eyes and said, One less than you think, my dear. You see, you cannot fake humility. The one who has it hardly knows it. It is the least obvious quality that a person possesses. So therefore, it must come from the Spirit of God. And so, if you have your Bibles, if you've turned, if you would, to John chapter 13, I want us to talk about one who is both gentle and humble in spirit. And along the way, I want us to look at some principles of humility that we find in this great chapter. As we begin to look at John chapter 13, I want you to do something just a little different as we look at the scripture this morning. I want you to just see the first part of several different verses. In verse 2, in verse 3, verse 4, and verse 12. Notice in verse 2, and during supper. Verse 3, Jesus. Verse 4, rose from supper. And then in verse 12, it says, And when he had washed their feet, and taken his garments, and reclined at the table again. You get it? Jesus is at the supper. This is the Passover meal. He arose from the meal. And then he does something totally unrelated to the meal, and then comes back to the meal and finishes it. What made him leave the supper? Why did Jesus, in the middle of this Passover meal, wash their feet? It's like sitting down to a Thanksgiving Day meal. Roast turkey, gravy, mashed potatoes, stuffing, cranberry sauce, several different kinds of salads, several desserts, just really waiting for you to enjoy them as well at the end of that meal. And suddenly, in the middle of a Thanksgiving Day meal, you get up from the table and go write a letter. Why would you do that? Why would you go write a letter in the middle of a Thanksgiving Day meal? And then come back after you finish the letter and finish your meal. And perhaps everybody else was probably done and you just finished this cold meal of Thanksgiving. Why would you do that? You see, it's the same kind of interruptive thought that we find here in this passage. Jesus is at the table, pushes himself away from the table, stops and takes the basin and fills it with water, and with towel he begins to wash their feet. He finishes, and then he sits back down at the table. Why would he do that? Well, there are two reasons. Let me give you the two reasons and then let me try to illustrate them both 
from Scripture. The first reason is because their hearts were proud. And secondly, don't laugh, their feet were dirty. You see, now obviously washing their feet was more than just washing dirty feet. It was more, much deeper than, than just the simplicity of washing their feet. There was a lesson, there were truths that Jesus knew that these disciples needed to understand and to hear. Now, if you would, take your Bible and put a finger here in John chapter 13 and turn, if you would, back to Luke chapter 22. Even though we are going back in our Bibles, we're going to the very same time, the very same event, only from a different perspective. Luke is going to include something here in this passage that John does not. And I want you to see why these disciples needed to learn about humility. Why he interrupted this meal and washed their feet. Luke tells us why they were in need of learning humility. In verse 14 of Luke chapter 22, we read, And when the hour had come, he reclined at the table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, If I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover meal with you before I suffer, for I say to you, I shall never again eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he said, Take this and share it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine from now until the kingdom of God comes. And when he had taken some bread and given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup, which is poured out for you, is the new covenant in my blood. But behold, the hand of the one who is betraying me is with me on the table." For indeed, the Son of Man is going as it has been determined, but woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. And they began to discuss among themselves which one of them it might be who is going to do this thing. Remember that? As they were gathered there at the Lord's table, sharing in this Passover meal, Jesus is saying to them, there is one who breaks bread, who is sitting around this table, who is going to... To betray me. Now, if you went back to the early first six verses of Luke chapter 22, you would see that Judas Iscariot has already made that decision. He's already met with the religious leaders that he is the one looking for an opportune time that he could betray the Lord Jesus Christ. And they began to look at Jesus when he said that one was going to betray him. And they began to ask the question, surely not I. Surely not I. The King James says, is it I? Is it I? The only one who knew for sure was Judas. And he was not going to reveal his secret. But this discussion, this question that they would ask themselves as to who was going to to betray the Lord Jesus becomes a dispute. It says in verse 24, And there rose also a dispute among them as to which one of them was regarded to be the greatest. The Greek word for dispute literally means a verbal fight. Can you believe this? This is the last night that Jesus is going to spend with his disciples. In less than 24 hours, he's going to die. He's going to be crucified. He's going to be beaten. And Jesus has all kinds of truths and things that he wants to teach them this night to his disciples. And they are arguing among themselves as to which one of them was the greatest. Do you see now the link of Luke chapter 22 in our passage in John chapter 13? Of why he stopped in the middle of the supper, why he arose, why he took the basin and poured the water and took the towel and began to wash their feet. 
Luke gives us the complete picture of why. They were arguing among themselves as to which one of them was the greatest. They were not humble. They were proud. They had proud hearts. Now let's go back to our passage in John chapter 13. Now let me remind you, not only did they have proud hearts, but they had dirty feet. Because they had not carried out the normal custom of the day of washing feet. Whenever you were invited over to someone's home, someone would meet you at the door. A servant, perhaps, with a basin of water and a towel. They would remove your sandals. They would wash your feet. You'd go into the home and you'd spend a delightful evening together. And when it was finished, you put your sandals back on and, and out the door that you would go. But they had not done this practical custom. Usually, when it was a voluntary group, the first one or two that would arrive would take it upon themselves to be the servant. And they would gather the basin and the water and the towel, and they would wash the individual's feet voluntarily. But not this crowd. <laughs> I'm convinced that the only one that had clean feet was Jesus, who probably arrived last and washed his own feet. And so here they are, arguing about who is the greatest. And Jesus pushes himself away from the table. Look at verse 1 of John 13. Now before the feast of the Passover, Jesus, knowing that the hour had come, that he should depart out of the world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Isn't that a great statement? He loved them and he loves us to the end. And during supper, the devil having already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, to betray him. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come forth from God and was going back to God, rose from the supper and laid aside his garments, and taking a towel, he girded himself about. So he pushes himself away from the table. He takes off the outer garment, of which there were two different layers. There was still the undergarment. He takes the basin, fills it with water, girds himself with the towel, and begins to wash their feet. Verse 5. Then he poured water into the basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. You see, they were willing to fight over the throne, but nobody wanted to fight for the towel. And so Jesus, with basin and water, knelt before each of them and began to wash their feet. Now the rub comes when he comes to Peter. Peter is not going to respond like the others. And so we read in verse 6, so he came to Simon Peter. Now, as we begin to look at this conversation that Jesus has with Peter, I want you to notice some principles of humility that are stated and implied in the scripture. I think they will be helpful for us to, to remember. The first is that humility oftentimes comes unannounced. Not once does Jesus say, hey, men, can I have your attention, please? I'm now going to demonstrate humility. He doesn't do that, does he? Because as soon as you do that, you're not humble. You cannot demonstrate humility by calling attention to it. And so Jesus comes to Peter, and he says, and Peter said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Now, the Greek structure is very interesting here. It literally says, Lord, you, my feet, do you wash? It's of great contrast. You, of all people, wash my, of all feet, you, mine? And Jesus answers him in verse 7, What I do, you do not realize now, but you shall understand hereafter. And Peter said to him, Never! Shall you wash my feet? Literally, no, never will you wash my feet, never even unto eternity. 
There's a second principle of humility, and that is humility is willing to receive. Humility is willing to receive. You see, at first glance, it almost sounds and looks as though Peter is the one who's being humble. It almost sounds as though he is saying, I should be the one who should be washing your feet. But this is not what Peter meant at all. This is pride. This is the kind of pride that will not admit that one's feet are dirty. This is the kind of pride that causes us to tuck under our garments the real truth about ourselves. And Peter says, you're never going to wash my feet. And Jesus responds in verse 8, If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. In other words, oh really, Peter? Well, there's the door. Wait a minute, Lord. If that's what it takes, wash my head, wash my feet, wash my entire body. Lord, not my feet only, verse 9, but also my hands and my head. And Jesus said to him, He who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you. For he knew the one who was betraying him. For this reason he said, not all of you are clean. Peter, you don't need a bath. You've already been bathed. Now Judas is not clean, but Peter, you are. Principle number three. Not only is, does humility often come unannounced, and oftentimes humility is being willing to receive without embarrassment, but third, humility is not a sign of weakness. Jesus is not weak with Peter. He tells him the truth. If you don't let me wash your feet, you have no part with me. Part of being my disciple is being honest. Peter, you have dirty feet. So being humble is being honest. There's a fourth and final principle, and that is humility does not play favorites. Look at verse 12. And so when he had washed their feet, you know who that includes? Sure. That includes Judas. You talk about an example of grace. You talk about a depth of humility. You ever wonder what Judas felt? What was going through his mind? As Jesus knelt before him, as he washed his feet, as he poured that water over his feet, as he wiped them clean, and Judas knowing that within hours he was going to betray this man who humbled himself before him. It's a powerful scene. I wonder sometimes if there is someone who has painted that picture that picture of Jesus kneeling and washing the feet of Judas. It's a picture of emotion. Now, one of the best methods to teach a lesson is the question and answer method that you just sort of ask a question, you let people sort of just wrestle with it, as to what their response. And that's what Jesus does. In verse 12 it says, And when he had washed their feet and taken his garments and reclined at the table again, he said, Do you know, here's the question, Do you know what I have done to you? Now the first truth that we want to see in regards to that question is found in verses 13 and 14. And as we read this passage together, I'm going to tell you to stop reading at a certain point and just look up. Okay? Look at verse 13. You call me teacher and Lord, and you were right, for so I am. If I then, the Lord and the teacher, washed your feet, you also ought to stop. Look up. If I'm the Lord, if I'm the teacher, Jesus said, and if I have washed your feet, you also ought to what? Our first response would be to wash the feet of Jesus. But that's not what he says. He says, If I then, the Lord and the teacher, washed your feet, you also ought to wash 
one another's feet. Listen, anybody would love to wash the feet of the Lord. We would stand in line to wash his feet. I mean, that would just be absolutely worship. He's my Lord and my Savior. But to wash the feet of someone else, that's a different story. We would love to wash the Savior's feet. But to wash my friend's feet, to wash my neighbor's feet, to wash somebody perhaps that I work with, that would be difficult for most of us. Two final thoughts. One, humility includes serving one another, not just the Lord. Serving the Lord is the greatest delight in in all of the world, but to serve one another is work. And then the second major truth by way of application is found in verse 15. For I gave you an example that you also should do as I did to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a slave is not greater than the master, neither is the one who is sent greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. Real happiness comes from demonstrating humility, not just learning about it. You see, it's easy to learn how to wash someone's feet. That's not very difficult at all. All you need is a container with some water and a towel. That's not very difficult. But to demonstrate it and to do it with humility oftentimes becomes another story. Let me try to illustrate this from my own personal life and ministry. Back in 2003, there was a family in our church in northern Minnesota that if you were to look at them, you would say, Roger and Sue are the all-American family. He was handsome, beautiful wife. His son was an athlete, had received a college scholarship to play football at a Christian college. He was an ice hockey player. Their daughter was a figure skater, a hockey cheerleader. It was the absolute picture of what a real family should look like. But underneath all of that, there was a facade. Roger was leading a double life. Roger was highly involved in the homosexual community of our city, unknown to his wife, unknown to his children, unknown to us as a part of his church. But then, just like any other secret, your sins will find you out. And I can still remember that day when the chairman of our elder board and myself sat down with Roger and his wife and confronted him with the truth of what was happening in his life. He absolutely denied that there was anything going on whatsoever. We knew better, we knew the truth. And so as Roger left our office that afternoon and as he went home and prepared to go to work that evening, he worked on a big paper machine up there in International Falls, Minnesota. And during one of his breaks, he went to the top of the roof of that that I-1 machine, which is over two blocks long. It's a huge machine, the largest paper machine in the world. As he stood on the roof, as he looked down, the thought that came across his mind, maybe I should jump. Just end life, get it over with. My problem would be solved and everybody would be a lot happier without me. But he decided against that. He decided that he needed to change his life and that as he finished the shift, as he went home, as he tried to get some sleep, He finally got up and walked into the kitchen and he said to his wife, everything they said is true. And that began an incredible journey. A journey to, as a church, to support, to strengthen him. And as we began to look for places that he could receive some help, we realized he didn't need outpatient, he needed inpatient. We looked in the state of Minnesota, we could not find anything. We finally found a ministry in Memphis, Tennessee called Love in Action. And for the next couple of years, Roger spent time and his life began to change. I remember the family flew me down from International Falls to Memphis for them to renew their wedding vows with one another. 
But then Love and Action decided that they wanted him to become a part of their staff and that he would have to raise his entire salary for the year, which was around $50,000. Now, that was going to be a very difficult task for Roger and Sue to do. They had lived all of their lives in northern Minnesota. They didn't have roots and people all across the country. And so we, again, decided as a church that we would do everything we could to help raise that money for them to be a part of this ministry. Somewhere along the line, it was decided that we would have a prayer walk, that we would walk from International Falls to Virginia, Minnesota, which is about 100 miles. And it was decided that we would walk about 20 miles a day. And when I say they decided, they decided that I would walk 20 miles a day. Now, at the time, I was walking 10, 12, 13, 14 miles a day, and so to add another six miles didn't seem like a very difficult thing to do. And there would be people that would join me along the way, and we would pray, and we would just bring this to the front that somehow people would see the seriousness of what we wanted to do to just put our arms around this family once again and to support them. I still can remember the Sunday night before the beginning walk on Monday morning. We were having an outdoor baptismal in our lake. And I had such low back pain that I was not able to participate, and so our other staff members were the ones who were involved in that baptismal service. And at the end of the evening, I asked the elders to come forward and lay hands on me and to pray over me, saying, look, in the morning, I begin this 100-mile trick. And I need all of the help that I can. I am in, I'm having pain, and I just I don't know how I'm going to do this, but I need God's help. And so they prayed. And so as I got up the next morning, and as a number of us began that walk, as we walked that 20 miles, wouldn't you know it, it was the warmest days of the summer. It was in August of 2003. The temperature was 95 degrees. The temperature, they told me, of the asphalt that we were walking on was over 120 some degrees. It was hot. And unbeknown to me, I began to form some blisters on my feet that I would soon realize later that day. As we finished that 20 mile trek, as somebody picked me up and brought me back to my home, as I, I remember lying down after showering and my feet were beginning to hurt. Not, I'd never experienced this before. My back was still giving me difficulties, but we made it through that first 20 miles. And I remembered lying down in bed saying, God, how am I going to be able to do this? I remember the key verse when I graduated from college, my life verse was Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. And as I fell asleep that afternoon, something quite amazing happened. When I woke up, the pain in my back was gone. The blisters weren't, but the pain in my back was gone. And so we did the second day of 20 miles. We did the third day. We are now up to 60. I was no longer being returned home, but now I was staying with some friends along the way. I remember meeting a medical doctor that went to our church at a McDonald's in Cook, Minnesota to examine my feet. And I remember as he popped those blisters, and I remember as he wrapped them and, and just basically said, man up, Larry, you can do this. And so we continued that walk toward Virginia. We were going to end the walk on Friday at noon at a place called New China Buffet. Whenever you're going to walk 100 miles, you need to end at a restaurant. So that seemed the appropriate thing to do. But what I did realize is that Roger and Sue had come to Virginia. And as I rounded the corner, as we began to head toward the restaurant, there they were. There was a chair and there was a basin filled with water and a towel. And as he, as he removed my tennis shoes, as he kind of peeled off those socks with the blisters, and later I would lose the big toe in my toenail, it was, it was quite a quite an event, let's just say, uh, as, we, as we finish this thing out. But as he knelt before me and washed my feet, what a powerful moment. What a powerful moment of humility. As he just exalted the Lord Jesus Christ, as he washed my feet, 
realizing and recognizing all that God had done for them as a family and as individuals. It was a powerful moment. You see, we deal with pride all of the time in our lives. Pride raises up its ugly face again and again. Sometimes pride reveals itself in a broken relationship with another person. Sometimes pride is just not just too much that we would go to that person and saying, look, I am sorry. I have done the wrong thing. I'm sorry that I did this and I want to build a bridge and mend this broken relationship. It could be pride like the prodigal son that you have walked away from the Lord and you are not walking with him as you ought to. This week I just returned from doing a funeral up in northern Minnesota and one of the people that I had an opportunity to visit with was a, a, a guy that I went to school with whose name was Mike. For over 50 years he had walked away from the Lord. His mother had prayed for him for decades. And just recently, within the last couple of months, he has given his life to the Lord Jesus Christ. He just wept as he shared his testimony with me. Maybe that's the kind of pride that needs to be broken in your life. Maybe it's a pride that has never trusted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. That somehow you just feel you can just do it yourself. God's Word says the one thing we cannot do for ourselves is to pay the price for sin that separates us from Him. And as we humble ourselves as little children, as we come and recognize that the result of our sin is death, but accepting and realizing the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Then pride is defeated as we humble ourselves before him. Our Lord Jesus had that kind of pride in his life. Paul writes in Philippians chapter 2, it says, Do nothing from selfish or empty conceit, but with, with humility of mind, let each of you regard one another as more important than himself. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Have this attitude in yourself, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of men, and being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. He humbled himself to place his life on that cross, to pay the price for your sin. And as those outstretched arms were nailed to that cross, as he bowed his head and said, it is finished. Everything the Father had sent the Son was accomplished in his life. And three days later, he would raise up from the dead, victorious over the power of sin and death and Satan. And because he lives, we too can live. He humbled himself, even in death. There's a little chorus that we have sung for years that many of you know, and it says, Make me a servant, humble and meek. Lord, let me lift up those who are weak. And may the prayer of my heart always be, Make me a servant, make me a servant, make me a servant today. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the power of the Word of God. Father, I thank you for the power of this scene that we've looked at together as Jesus humbled himself and knelt before these disciples and washed those dirty feet, only to teach them the lesson that they too needed to humble themselves before one another. Father, during this time of this virus, Lord, we are being humbled as a people, as a community, as a church, 
and as a nation. Father, I pray that we would just look unto you, who is the author and the finisher of our faith, that we would look unto you for our strength, that we might look to find ways that we can reach out and help others during this time. Father, I pray, teach us the depth of humility. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.